This is going to be the last Sunday of our uh, Songs for Life. And uh, we want to talk about how to live a good life. Now, I'm sure no one got up this morning and said, man, I really want to have a miserable life. That's just not the way we're programmed. But it seems like a lot of people, older in life, look back with regret. I did not live the way I should have lived. And they have regrets. Not that they started out to do that. They just somehow they got, got derailed. I want to look at Psalm 73. Now, Psalm 73 is the opposite of Psalm 37. And by that I mean 3, 7, 7, 3. Okay? They're just, uh, but these are like my two favorite psalms in the whole book of the Psalms. Okay? And Psalm 73 is written by Asaph. Asaph was the choir director, the music director, during the time of David and Solomon. And uh, he wrote this song, and uh, he starts out saying something really, really powerful. Surely God is good to Israel. I love that line. Israel was God's people. And so I think this text is saying, surely God is good to his people. God is good to his people. To those who are of a pure heart, all right? God is good to his people. Now, I, I think it goes like this. I, I'm going to add to scripture here. Sorry, folks. I mean, I, you very rarely see me do this, but I, I put in a little word in only. God is only good to his people. Even when we're disciplined by the Lord, it's good because he is only good to his people. So I want you to say this with me, what it says up there. God is only good to his people. Come on, say it again. God is only good to to his people. Now I want you to say it like you believe it. God is only good to his people. You see, sometimes we forget that, don't we? Yeah, we do. The New Testament puts it this way. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Yeah, sometimes you're going through a difficult struggle. It's a terrible time. And God is actually orchestrating that some way for good. Someone has said it's like a beautiful tapestry. On the front side, it looks beautiful. Did you ever look at the back side? <laughs> Bunch of knots and gnarls and switches of colors and everything. It's not the most beautiful thing. We're looking at life from the back side. God looks at it from the top side. <laughs> And he's working everything together for good. That's what the text says. Now, as I go to the next slide, in this psalm, Asaph says, I have some regrets in life. <laughs> Imagine that. He says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped and I had nearly lost my foothold. I know what it's like to lose your, your, your grip, your slip. All right, I, I, your footing. I, I know what it's like. When I lived uh, just outside Muskegon and Norton Shores, we, our house was on a dune, a sand dune. My driveway was very, very steep. And uh, on a snowy day, you couldn't get in it without an all-wheel drive vehicle. So we had all-wheel drive vehicles. And uh, when in 2014, when we were moving back to this side of the state, and uh, I came over, we came over for a full week. Well, just as we left, it had rained and froze. And so my driveway had a nice sheet of ice on it. Well, if you know anything about that side of the state, you get, uh, your, every day you get lake effect snow. About three inches every day we'd get. So when we went back after a week, all the streets had been plowed, you know. I mean, they'd been packed down, really, not so much plowed, but packed down. And uh, so when I got home, I saw I had like a foot of snow. I got an all-wheel drive. So I whip up into that driveway, and I get about halfway up, and my tires are cutting through the snow, and now they're hitting that sheet of ice. So I'm halfway up the dune, and now my car is going down backwards. And so I look both ways, nothing's coming. I went right back into cross street into my neighbor's driveway. <laughs> I said, oh yeah, my garage door is open because I got my opener, you know, so I, I gun it. And I'm gunning it, man, I'm going, and I'm getting to the top, and then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm gonna go through the back side of this garage. <laughs> Soon as I hit the garage pavement, man, I slam on my brakes, I stop. I'm in the garage. And then I said to myself, oh my goodness. How am I going to get to church tomorrow morning? <laughs> I had to speak the next day. I said, 
there's no braking. You, hit, you put the brakes on to, uh, that ice. So I said, I better go out and check the situation. So I go out and I'm at the top of the dune where my house is on and, and, and I'm at the top and I'm looking at it and all of a sudden, out from underneath me go my feet. I go sliding all the way down my driveway out into the middle of the road on my back. I know what it's like to have slippery feet, okay? So I get up and I said, okay, I got to go back up this slippery driveway. I can't go up the slippery driveway. So I go on the lawn, because at least on the lawn I can actually, you know, get a little bit of grip. I get to the top and I said, I got to put some salt on this situation. So I get the salt and I'm out there throwing the salt and it happened again. Whoop, out from underneath me, down I go, right out in the middle of the street again. I said, oh, what do you think? You got to stand on the lawn to throw the salt, okay? I know what it's like to be on slippery slopes. Asaph says, as but for me, my feet had almost slipped. We call this backslide. I'd almost slid backwards in my walk with the Lord. I know that the Lord is only good to his people, but as for me, I'd almost slipped. I almost went backwards. I almost said, God's not so good. God, why are you letting this happen to me? So he, he said, I'm almost slipped. Well, the question is, why? Why was he slipping? And the answer is found, I believe, in the next verse. He said, because he had envy. Envy. His regret was envy, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I got a green eye with envy there. See that? <laughs> Envious of others' prosperity. Now, I want to hit these really fast, okay? It says, I, I, I had envy that they have no struggle. All I do is struggle. Look at Their bodies are healthy and strong. But he says, not mine. I'm envious over that. They're free from the burdens that are common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Here's a person who obviously was not doing well. I don't know what the, what the physical ailment may have been. But he says, he, he's looking and saying, you know, I'm feeble, I'm weak. And a person who doesn't even know the Lord, they're strong and, and they're healthy. And they're envious of the person who's got the health and I don't have it. He's envious. That happens sometimes. Why do I always get sick? Well, if you weren't a school teacher and you weren't around all those runny-nosed kids, maybe that would... <laughs> I don't know why you're always sick. I don't know. I understand that. He goes on and he says, he was envious. He says, therefore, pride in the, is their necklace. Listen, they are arrogant and proud and they flaunt it in your face. You're religious? What's God doing for you? They clothe themselves with violence. Years ago, I went down town Detroit with uh, the Gideons. You know who the Gideons are? The people that pass out Bibles. And we had New Testaments. We stood outside of one of the major high schools in Detroit. And I was passing out New Testaments the kids that were coming out of school. When this car pulls up behind me, it is a tricked-out Cadillac. And it's obviously a pimp and a drug pusher. And he cruises by real slow, and he takes his hand, and he fans out all the way around, $100 bills to these kids. He's cruising by. And what's he doing? He's flaunting. I got all this He's given you a Bible. That's what's going on here? He's, he said, I've been envious that they do all that and life goes so well for them. Why? He said, I, I, I can't regret. He, said, he says, from their callous heart, listen, I have a soft heart. You have a soft heart. My heart is touched by people in need. From their callous hearts come iniquity and evil. Conceits of their minds has no limit. They, they stomp, they trample all over people. And here, I'm the guy that I care about people. He goes on. They scoff and speak malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. They threaten. They're making threats. They're hostile. He goes on. He says, their mouths lay claim to heaven. They brag as if they are God. And their tongues take possession of the earth while they're just absorbing and taking over everything. And, and, and Asaph says, man, I'm, I'm looking at all this. 
my regret is that I've been looking at all of this and letting it go into my heart and I'm becoming envious of them because everything in their life seems to be going well and mine's not. He says, therefore, their people, that is these wicked people, their friends, they turn to them and they drink up water in abundance. This is an idiomatic expression. It's kind of like the expression we have, the person sucks all the air out of the room. So there's nothing left for me to breathe. This person drinks up all the water so that there's nothing for me to drink. He says, I envy that everything is going what appears to be well for them. They say, how can God know? Now they start attacking theology. They're blasphemous. Does the Most High have knowledge? God doesn't know. There's no God. They're blasphemous. He wraps it up with this. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. They increase in their wealth. They're carefree. They put God out of their heads. This is all there is. Get all the gusto of life you can. And they, they seem to be just increasing in all their wealth. Everything seems to go wonderful for them. He says, I was reflecting on this. Here's my reflection. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. Well, the word vain means empty. So I got the heart there. Surely in vain. I got it white because I've kept it pure but I'm on empty. Seems like they have everything, I have nothing. I'm empty. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. He says, why did I bother? What is the use of living a good Christian life when the wicked prosper and the righteous seem to be trampled underfoot? All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. Man, I, this guy is feeling so down. You, you catch that flavor here? Well, it's not like you've never had a day like that, right? Sure you have. A day like this. He said, but I had some reservations. Oh, I had reservations, he said. If I had said, I will speak thus. You see, he, he never said any of that. It was all going on in his mind. It was going on in his mind. He said, I, I just didn't have the courage to come out and say anything like that. He said, if I had said, thus I will speak, okay, I would have betrayed your children. He said, I, I couldn't bring myself to verbalize it and get it out there because of somebody else's life it may have hurt. You see, he's the song director. He's the choir master, the nation of Israel. He knows everybody's looking to him. He say. I, I've got this envy in my heart and I, I, I don't know what to do with it. And he's saying, but I can't verbalize it. I can't get it out there because I don't want to bring anybody else down. I don't want them to come down to where I am at at this moment. So he put the tape all over his mouth. He said, just keep it inside. Keep it inside. That's when the revelation came. It's then that God reveals something to him. He said, when I tried to understand all this, oh, it was oppressive to me, man. I was so depressed. And it's in that, that depressed state where he's so envious that it's just eating him up on the inside because he's looking out at what everybody else has got who doesn't know the Lord, and he does, and, and everything seems to be going so badly. He said, I was depressed till I entered the sanctuary of God. Now, um, uh, just heads up, Asaph has never been to Bethany Church, okay? <laughs> All right, just, just, I don't want my slides to confuse you here. The sanctuary then may have actually been Solomon's temple. If not, it was the tabernacle. A and the reference in the passage seems to indicate it was the courtyard. He came into the courtyard, and, and in the courtyard, as you're in the courtyard, what you notice is a, you notice a big bronze altar. And, and you notice people bringing up <clears throat> animals and that they're killing the animals and taking its blood and you're sprinkling it around the altar on the horns and, and you're seeing the sacrifice take place. And you see behind it there's this labor 
and the laborers where they would ceremonially wash, the priests would wash themselves and they'd wash the parts of the animals that they would put on the altar to burn. They were seeing the sacrifice take place. And it says, until I, he said, all this was going on until I went into the, the sanctuary and I saw that there was a substitutionary death to cover my sins. All of a sudden, the lights came on for Asaph. The lights came on. You say, how did the lights come on? Well, he said, then I understood their final destiny. I understood their final destiny. They don't know the Lord. All they have is the here and now. Nothing more. You see, all they have is the dot of life. I got the dot up there. I talk about the dot a lot. I like the dot. That dot represents your life. It's a small, small little point. It gets smaller and smaller when you begin to compare it to the line, which is all eternity. And so the line goes on forever and ever and ever, and you got this little dot. What is your life? It is a vapor. It appears for a little while and it vanishes away. It's a dot that's momentary, and then it's gone. But what you believe in the dot determines where you spend the line all eternity. If you believe in Jesus, you spend it above the line. If you don't, you spend it below the line. But what you do in this dot, with whatever God has dished out to you and assigned to you in his providence, how you, how you live your life determines to what degree of reward and what degree of punishment you get for all eternity. So life is absolutely crucial. He says, when I tried to understand all this, it depressed me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. I don't know if it was the seeing the sacrifice. I'm just guessing. And I don't know what part of the service it is that brings you, gives you what you need to carry you on for the rest of the week. Maybe it's a wonderful song that was sung this morning. And, and, and God just touched your heart and said, man, I needed that. Uh, maybe it's just the opportunity to give back to God uh, an offering and saying, you know what? I'm trusting you, God. I, I don't know. I don't have enough money to make my own ends meet, but I'm going to give you a tenth expecting you to do something to bless, open the windows of heaven. I don't know what part it is. Maybe it was uh, reading the scriptures here. Maybe it's some uh, other thought that jumps in your mind while we're having the message. But it says, when I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood. You see, church brings clarity. Worship brings clarity of why in the world you are here. He says, my realization is this. I then realized, this is what I realized. Surely you've placed them on slippery ground. Not the temporary of the dot. Not slippery ground here. They're on slippery ground for eternity. Watch what he says. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed. Completely swept away by terrors. You getting a picture here? We get terrorists for a moment here in this life, a little terrorist activity here, a little terrorist there. This is eternal terrorist. Terrorism by the supreme terrorist, our, ad, our adversary, the devil. Man, all of a sudden I realized, I'm worried about a speck? They should be worried about all the eternity. My realization, there is a lot more than just this life. He says, as a dream, when one awakens, so when you arise, Lord, you will despise them as a fantasy. Their little dot is simply a fantasy. And when, when, the, when you awake for all eternity, that fantasy is gone. What are they left with? What are they left with? Utter ruin. How in the world can I be envious of those who have no future? Isn't that amazing? Then he gets this reassurance. Oh man, he said, I went to sanctuary. Something there spoke to my heart. And I have a reassurance. And here it is. When my heart was grieved and my spirit was embittered, when, when I was that envious person and I was getting bitter with God and I was grieved because I didn't have and they had everything, he said, I was a senseless and ignorant. <laughs> you know what he's doing? He's confessing his sin. And he's not painting a pretty picture. I was a brute beast before you. 
Remember that one song we used to sing, uh, Such a Worm as I? I'm just, I, I, when you come in the presence of a holy God and you realize that I'm just a finite sinner, you become a brute beast. And he's saying, oh my goodness, in all my envying, I was nothing but a brute beast. In spite of that, here's what he says, God, you knew I was a brute beast. Yet I am always with you. Even when I'm a brute beast, <laughs> God does not give up on me. I sometimes give up on him, he doesn't give up on me. I sometimes get embittered with him, he doesn't get embittered with me. I, I sometimes grieve him. You know what? He doesn't get grieved over me. He, he loves me with an everlasting love. He said, you hold me by my right hand. So even when I'm on the slippery slope, man, if I had been holding on to his, with my right hand, been holding on to something sturdy and solid, I wouldn't have wound up in the street. And so I'm holding on to his hand. And he says, even when I'm on the slippery slope, remember what he said, my feet were almost slipped away. I hadn't slipped. Almost. Because he's holding me by my right hand. And so I have this reassurance that he is with me. He says, not only that, you guide me. You show me the way. He goes on in the next verse, and he says, and afterward, you'll take me up into glory. My goodness. How, how much better does he get? After my dot is over, I'm going up. I don't know if the escalator is really gold or not. In fact, I'm not even sure it's an escalator. <laughs> but you get the picture. I'm going up. I'm going up. Whom have I in heaven but you? Oh, now he's getting down to the real heart of it. So far, it's been all about me. My feet. I went into the sanctuary. And he finally said, whoa, it, it, it's all about you. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth, earth has nothing I desire besides you. Really, what on earth here do you want to take with you to heaven? Your car? Your house? Oh my goodness, your house is going to look like a shack compared to the mansion in heaven. Are you kidding me? What, what, do you, what do you have here that you want to take? On earth I have nothing that I desire besides you. This is what I want. I want you not just later. I want you now. I want you now. He said, my flesh, what's this? My heart may fail. I might even have a heart attack. But God, is the strength of my heart and God is my portion forever. God is enough. Would you say it with me? God is enough. Oh, I love that. My God is enough. He's enough. He's enough. Getting right down to the end of the psalm, he says, here's my reward. Those who are far off will perish. Those who wasted the dot, they'll perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Those who are unfaithful, those are people without faith. They have no faith. But as for me, here's the word good, and that's why I talk about the good life. It is good to be near God. I want to be near God. So I get my eyes off of everyone else in the envy, and I just get my eyes on the Lord. He says, I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I go to him. When, when there's an envious situation coming, I just run to the tower of my strength. I run to the Lord. He says, and I will tell of all your deeds. You see, he, he's finally got the focus right. It's not about me. It's all about you. It's about what you will do. That's what it's about. I want to sum this all up, okay? I want to sum it all up. I think I have it in one little summary statement. The Lord is only good to his people. Will you say that with me? The Lord is only good to his people. One more time. The Lord is only good to his people. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. Here is my final thought on this today. You can become one of his people today. You can become one of his people today. You just have to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior who rescues you from all your failures. The Bible calls that sin. All your failures. The word sin means you missed the target. You failed to hit the target. You confess that 
I blew it. I failed. I need you to rescue and save me from that. You do that and say, Lord Jesus, be my Savior, be my God. I confess you, the Son of God, the Christ. Save me. He will. You'll become one of his people. Everything will work together for good because God is only good to his people. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, sometimes we get envious and we ought not. We just have our eyes focused in the wrong direction. We have them all horizontally instead of going up vertically and looking up to you. Help us redirect our focus. Perhaps today there's someone here who says, you know, I need Jesus in my life. I, I need to redirect my focus. I want you to be only good to me, Lord. So right now that they'll lift up their heart and pray and say, Lord, forgive me of all my failures, all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I confess you as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Some of us feel like Asaph. We know you, Lord, and our feet were almost slipped. We're going in the wrong direction. We get envious. We say, what's the use? Why try? We want to throw up our hands in the air and quit. But where can I find salvation? It's only for God. So turn our backslidings. Have us re redirect our focus, even today. So right now, Lord, the one who's struggling, I pray that they just lift up their eyes to you and say, Lord, I'm going to hang on all the tighter to your hand because I know you won't let me slip. Reassure them, Lord, with a blessing, just enough, so they know that you are hanging on to them. We want the struggle to be enough that we won't let go, Lord. So give us that balance in our life. Enough difficulties so that we don't trust ourselves, but trust in you. Enough success, Lord, to know that we can rely upon that hand that's extended from above to us to hold us up. Bless in Jesus' name. Amen.